don't say anything you don't want to be recorded so the recording is um, is uh, is started okay uh, I'm going to uh, share with you my applications screen and go to PowerPoint and here's some slides. Uh, let's go back to the very beginning of this right here. And so this is um, oh, a list of things. Okay, so um, this is kind of what I, I have envisioned for our uh, time today. Uh, I want to share some good news with you and uh, you maybe already know of the good news, but I will share it with you anyway. I am going to start this um, uh, period by polling people. I'm going to be polling alphabetically. So, you know, my plan is to call on everybody so you don't have to. I mean, uh, I think it is alphabetical by first name. It's however it works uh, on uh, on Blackboard. But I'll go over and I'll ask you, do you have anything to share, any questions, any issues, whatever. And we'll just do some of that after the good news. Uh, and then we're going to look back just a little bit and we're going to evaluate some limits that you should know how to um, evaluate. Now, when I say you should know how to evaluate, uh, I realize that some people have, in fact, everybody, I think, has complicated lives these days. And so you might be um, not uh, current on this, but you can get current and, you know, I'll discuss it within context and things like that. But these are some problems that, you know, I, I could be asking and that if somebody is 100% uh, caught up, then they're probably feeling in good shape doing this. Uh, then we will talk about some new stuff today. Uh, and the new stuff is we're going to talk about what it means for a function to be continuous. You might remember that I tried to make a very big deal of the fact that the limit as x tends to c of f of x doesn't depend on what happens at c at all. And that is true for the limit. But when we're talking about continuity, it matters a great deal what happens at C. So this is kind of a oh, subtle issue, uh, but important one for you to understand. And then, and this might be a stretch objective, but then we start talking about properties of uh, continuous functions. And one of the most uh, important properties of uh, continuous functions is one called the intermediate value property for continuous functions. So, uh, you know, I'll just watch and see how far we get. And uh, if we uh, if we go all the way, that's uh, that's great. If we don't go all the way, that's uh, that's fine, and we'll move from there. Now, just let me leap into the good news. Then, uh, the good news is that I um, saw an email. I think it was sent early this morning uh, from Dr. Brian Caputo, who, as you know, is the president of the College of DuPage. I also uh, saw Brian in the hall this morning, and I spoke with him and. Uh, you know, uh, greeted him and told him I was excited about coming back. And, and, you know, he sort of smiled. He was happy about this, too. And you should be happy about this, too. So that means the plan is has been confirmed yet again that, yes, we're on track. And so the, the, the plan, I mean, if you don't hear anything else, that means on February the 7th, uh, you show up in our classroom and that's where we start doing uh, doing things. Now, that has a lot of, uh, you know, good consequences because we won't have to do, you know, all kinds of fancy things online and having people uh, do things that they've never done before, like, you know, um, take pictures of the work and things like that. And so, you know, this it is it is very good news. Uh, so anyway, I wanted to make sure I shared that good news with you. You should have gotten the same email that I did. And someone may have asked a question, but I'm about ready to go to the polling. So I'm going to stop sharing for right now. I'm going to end the show. I'm going back to Blackboard, and I'm going to see that there's a comment here. Looks like there's a comment. Oh, do we need to get tested before? Uh, I need to look at the whole thing. Um, do we? Yes. Do we need to get tested beforehand? Um, and the answer is, uh, and, and, and Alex answered that too and i think alex's answer is correct but i'm going to um i'll tell you a, a couple of things on my uh on my uh roster sheet 
Uh, and in fact, I talked with my daughter about this, so I'm going to share this with you too. On my roster sheet, I have a box that tells me with the students, and I'm trying to think of the word, I'm going to use the word certified, uh, but that means you are certified. Now, there are two ways that you can be certified at the College of DuPage. One way that you can be certified is uh, that you have on file. Uh, a copy of your vaccination records and your vaccination records are up to date. And if so, they'll, they'll say, and I, I, I don't remember what the word is, but, but, but something like certified. So I can, I, you know, I will see that people are certified. Okay. Um, and that's one way you can be certified is having all your vaccinations and having all the documentation on, on, um, uh, on file with the college. Now, another way that you can be certified is that you will have a test uh, that is on record at the college that is less than uh, one week old. So if you're going this route, you will be getting, an, until the policy changes, uh, you're supposed to be getting tested every week. And there is a testing site on the college it's in the SRC building. It's right above the um, uh, the bookstore, and uh, you know, and and there's a lot of arrows going to there, and things like that. So you can go there and get tested. Now, what the requirement is that you have a test that is on file, and that says that you are not um, uh, you you did not test positive for COVID. So uh, what and and so anyway and the powers that be have deemed that the faculty is supposed to enforce this in some way. Now the college is prepared to enforce this also. And so if you're not having a positive check mark there, uh, you're going to be, um, the, the, the college will make sure that you get, uh, get a positive uh, check mark there. So you need to, you know, if you, if you need to get tested or something, you want to be going, uh, during this week and make sure that it, you know, it gets there and everything else. Now the college also has given me some forms to hand out to students who are not showing up as um, certified test testing. And I was thinking about this and I thought, wow, how awkward this is because if I walk up with, I don't think we have anybody named Susie in this class, but if let's pretend we did have a hypothetical Susie. So if we had a hypothetical Susie and I walked up to Susie and handed her this a piece of paper, everybody in the class would say, uh oh, Susie's in trouble. She, you know, she, she apparently didn't, um, you know, is not not compliant or, or, or whatever word uh, we want to use. And I don't want to do that to Susie. I wouldn't want to do that to, to anybody. And so what I think I'm going to do, and um, at least this is my plan, I plan on printing out one of those forms for everybody in the class. Now, and, and, and you could think about this in your head, it's, to, it's just the way I would pass out papers. And this can be good for me and, and good for you because this way I can practice your names. So I will have a stack of papers, one for everybody, okay? And on my hypothetical Susie's piece of paper, I would write in, um, and not in you know harsh language, but I'll just say, hey, uh, the college says you are non-compliant. And so Susie knows that. But then let's suppose I have a hypothetical Billy who has his uh, all of his vaccinations and they're all on file with the college and everything else. I will hand Billy a piece of paper too, but Billy's piece of paper will say, oh, you are compliant, okay? And that might mean Billy's stuff is there and then there might be a Joey. I, actually, I'm sorry, we have a Joey. I don't want people to think I'm talking about anybody. It's not Joey, we have a Joseph. So God, I gotta think of a name that we don't have. Uh, I don't think there is a Gertrude in this class. Okay, so suppose Gertrude uh, is, uh, is, is someone who got tested rather than, than you know, having vaccination files, but she got tested as she was supposed to. Uh, what I will do is in, on Gertrude's little piece of paper that I hand her, and see everybody's getting a piece of paper so nobody knows anything about anybody. Um, uh, so I will hand Gertrude a piece of paper and said, uh, you are also deemed compliant at this time. And so that's what I think I'm going to do 
uh, just to you know do what the college wants me to do. And again, the the spirit of this is trying to keep everyone um, uh, safe. Okay, so I'm going to just uh, throw this out here before I begin my poll because someone you know asked the question immediately uh, at the outset, which I guess is okay. Um, do we have more discussion on this or are we pretty good? And I'll count to 10 Mississippi in case people wanna you know, shout out questions. Okay, I just hit 10 Mississippi. So I'm gonna pretend that we know all of those, uh, you know, the answers, to, I mean, we're, we're comfortable with what I just said, that we have some understanding. And now what I'm gonna do is just go through the list and these are alphabetically, probably by first name. I'm not really sure, but I'll call on you. And either uh, you certainly can text if you're having, or not texting, uh, what is it called, chatting. You can chat if you don't have, um, if you're having technology problems or that's what you want to do, feel free to go on mic and speak because speaking is good. And so I'm starting and um, the top of my list um, is, um, and the only reason he is at the top is because it is alphabetical, but it is Alex Felton. Alex, uh, how are you? And do you have any questions or comments? I'm good, uh, no questions so far. So thanks professor. Okay, so that is good to go. So, and again, uh, not only Alex, but everybody is always welcome to ask questions. I and that's very important uh, to me. Okay, I have uh, Annie in. Annie, how are you doing? And do you have any questions or comments? Um, I'm good. Um, my only question is, um, can we turn in the LSA one in person? If we're going to be back by then. Yes, yes, you can, and that's a good question. And maybe I could have, uh, you know. Uh, said that, but you can turn it in in person on uh, February 7th, which is one week from uh, today. And that I'd, I'd really just much rather that be happening just so we don't have to do all this song and dance. But no, just show up then. Okay, so that is good and you can hand it to me and that will be good. Okay, uh, I'm going to assume that was all of Annie's questions. Artemio. Uh, how are you and uh, do you have questions or a comment or anything? I'm fine, thank you, no questions. All right, excellent, we will move on. Uh, Cecilia, how are you and yours doing and uh, do you have questions or comments that we should uh, talk about uh, and share with the group? I'm all right and I don't have any questions. All right, so that is, uh, that is good. Again, questions are always uh, welcome. We're going now to um, Derek Canada. Hey, um, there is a professor, Derek, at the College of DuPage whose name is Canada, and I think it's spelled the same way as yours, and she is a friend of mine. Uh, she's a remarkable person. Uh, are you perhaps related to her? <laughs> no, I'm not. Okay, and, and by the way, that's that, that, that's neither here nor there, but it's not a a super common name, so I, I thought, well, who knows? It 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 it, uh, it might be. I do know she does have children because once upon a time, wow, this was a long time ago. But I went to an Easter brunch. This was back when my wife was alive, and we went to uh, an Easter brunch with my wife and kids and stuff like that. And I saw her across the way, and so I do know that she has children, uh, but I don't remember how old the children were or anything. Okay, so Derek, enough of that nonsense. Uh, how how are you otherwise, and do you have any questions? Questions you want to uh, raise at this time? Uh, I'm doing good. At the, uh, I only have one question. I actually joined the class a week late, so I missed all the introduction stuff. And uh, last week, I'm still catching up on that. So I just wanted to ask if we had um, a book we needed to purchase or anything. Yeah, and and I mean there is a book, and it's Thomas. I think it is the well. I'm guessing right now. I think it's the 14th edition. But here's the thing I want to tell you, and uh, I'm not just. I mean, I guess I am telling you this, but I'm also repeating it. Um, oh, for your classmates, but it, it's important information. And it is worth repeating. One of the things that I do and particularly in this goofy start where we start remote and so on and so forth. Uh, I am using the course announcements as a mechanism for communicating with the class. Now that doesn't mean people in the class can't come to my office hours and we can't have private talks, we can, but just when I'm communicating to the class at large, I use that. And um, 
and what I do is when I post something there, I send emails to everybody who is on the class roster as well. But I don't delete the announcements. So you see, you have a nice resource there, Derek, for you. Uh, starting the class, you know, welcome to the class. Um, but uh, you have a very nice resource there for you because if you go back to the beginning of the announcements and look at them and go watch the videos and things like that, you'll find many of your questions will be answered that way. All right. Well, thank you. And and I do really like to do this because sometimes I'm like, gosh, did I do this or not? And so I can say, well, let me go back and check in my – it's almost like a journal for me of, you know, things I've asked the students to look at or, uh, you know, things we've covered, things like that. So, you know, there were some review lectures we did at the beginning, and um, I don't know, maybe you missed a lecture or two. Uh, but anyway, they're um, pretty much there. In fact, I'm going to say that they all are there. Uh, in video form at at present. So uh, welcome to the class, um, and uh, do look at that because I I invested some serious time in trying to talk about things that I thought were important. Okay, so that is um, that is there. Anything else, Derek? No, not at the moment. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, so welcome. Uh, we go to Herr Patel. How are you today? And uh, do you have any questions or comments to share with the group? Um, hi, I'm good, and I don't have any questions right now. Okay, excellent. That's all fine. Now, my sound guy, Jeffrey Weinholz, is next. And, uh, and Jeffrey, I do appreciate what you're doing for me with that. Uh, but uh, right now, I'm not asking if you can hear me. I'm just really saying, do you have any comments or questions to share with the class? And more generally, asking, how are you? I'm good, thank you. And um, I do not have any questions at the moment. Okay. Now, by the way, as time goes on, I'm probably not going to spend a lot of time in class doing this, but just know that your questions are welcome and you can ask them at uh, any time. And so, you know, and in the class, what you'd probably do is raise your hand or something. I'd say, hey, Jeffrey, what's on your mind? But anyway, okay, so that is good. We will go to um, uh, Joseph. Uh, and so, uh, Joseph, how are you and yours? And do you have uh, anything? <laughs> you want to raise or share with the class? Uh, I'm all good. I don't have any questions. Okay. Thank you, Joseph. We'll go to Kang Lee. And Kang Lee, how are you today? And I hope everybody is, uh, you know, well in your uh, in your space. And do you have any questions or comments about uh, things you want to um, raise at this time? Yeah, I'm all right. I'm good if I have a question. Okay. So he is good. That's great. We'll go to Mark uh, Zayden, and uh, Mark, uh, uh, how are you, and uh, anything on your mind uh, about this course that uh, causes you to want to ask a question? Uh, I'm doing good, and I have uh, no questions. Okay, that's good. Your questions, of course, like everyone's, are always welcome. Uh, Michael, uh, let's see, Shon, Shonman, I guess. Uh, so, Michael, uh, how about you? How are you, and... Uh, uh, anything you want to bring up for the class? I'm good, and I have no questions. All right, excellent. These are almost like sound checks. Thank you, Michael, then. And we will go to uh, Ryan uh, Keener Austin. Hey, uh, Ryan has a hyphenated last name. And uh, that just reminds me that, well, okay, hmm, uh, this is not going to make much sense. But one of the um, uh, per people, that I, professional tutors that I'm working with in my classes has a hyphenated last name, and he is Jesse Hayes Carver. He's a wonderful person. But you have a wonderful person, too, named Linda Shaw. And so, anyway, Linda is your GSD leader. And uh, you really, um, I would strongly encourage you to, you know, hook up with her. She can help you a lot. Uh, and sorry, Ryan, for that uh, thing. I, I, I actually, on one hand, I, I, I would say I suffer from, you know, I, I, I jump around a lot. Uh, but uh, that also is sometimes uh, all kind of good. Okay, so uh, let's see. And Okay, so I have somebody who's jumping in and out of the course. They might be having technical difficulties. So, Ryan, do you have anything? Uh, no, I don't have any questions or comments, so thank you. Okay, and, and you're doing okay, right? Yeah, I'm doing well. 
All right, excellent. Timor, you are next. Can you, um, uh, you know, weigh in? Do you have any issues, and how are you? Uh, yeah, I'm good. Uh, so for the, um, what's it called, the testing thing, I got a question. I forgot what it was. Okay, for now, okay. Now, there's um, two kinds of things floating out there that you could be talking about testing. Uh, one uh, yeah. is well, uh, the LSAs, or the other thing is, oh yeah, the midterm and all that, and those are two different topics. But uh, but anyway, so can you uh, clarify which, or I can certainly speak to both of those. Yeah, I, I was actually talking about the uh, the COVID testing. Um, so okay, how do good. I turn that in? Like, how do I uh, submit my stuff? Okay, um, I'm going to make a a note here. Uh, I, I think what you do is you contact um, student affairs, okay? And I will – now, I'm not going to do that until um, – and, and by the way, I'm just telling you how I did it. Mm -hmm. I have – and, and for whatever it's worth, I don't have to tell you this, but I am telling you this. And Annie, uh, I will uh, call on you in just a moment. Annie's, I think, going to add something to, to what I'm going to say. Um, I uh, scanned my Vax thing and I sent it in. If you go to get tested, they send the test to the student affairs. And what I was going to pledge to do is that I will um, uh, share with the class um, uh, sort of uh, a place that you could reach out and uh, uh, you know, and, and uh, ask about that. I think there's also a video I may refer you to. That uh, that talks about how you um, how you do that. Okay, uh, Annie, you're you were wanted to contribute to this, and, and Annie, I'm lowering your lowering lower lowering lower lower your hand. I'm going to lower your hand, but I'm calling on you. Go ahead. Okay, so the way I submitted it is you can log into my access, and there's a link that says like um, submit Vax info. Um, it's an easy way to do it, I think. And that will work very well for students who are vaccinated and have the documentation uh, for that. And I'll tell you what I have, and I, you didn't ask about this, but I am well vaccinated. Um, and uh, I am just telling you that's, that's what I chose to do. And uh, I have a little card. And what I did was, uh, you know, sort of scanned my card and sent an email in. And I do know the college knows that knows my status and, and, and considers me good. Now, and Annie is correct, but there's the second way this can happen, Timor, and that is if a student, which is the right, uh, chooses just to get regularly tested, and I think that's the current plan is for that to happen once a week, uh, you either have to file record of that test or uh, you can go to the testing facility at the College of DuPage. It's SRC uh, 2000 is the room, and it's dedicated to that, and there's people there. There's, In fact, there's three lines. Now, I've never seen the lines all done, but, uh, you know, uh, people in all three lines. But they, they, they might be because maybe a bunch of students do that. But this would require them to go to the college and do that. And then what they would do is they would get in, um, get in line, they would get their test, and then they would either get a get a text or something saying how they were, but at the same time, if you get tested there on the College of DuPage facility, they will send your test results to, I don't know, I'm going to say the Dean of Students Office or something like that, just for their record keeping. Okay, so, and again, Annie, thank you for contributing. You guys can help each other a lot, and that was good that you contributed. And Annie certainly described in, in good detail how to do it. If you have been vaccinated and have that documentation, then you can do what Annie said. Otherwise, you can go to the place I said, and you can get tested. So, Timor, I think that's the best answer you're going to get right now, but I think it's a pretty good answer. Yeah, it's good. Thank you. And I'll tell you another thing, uh, too, uh, about the College of DuPage. There's a place that's called Campus Central, and there are people there, and it's in the middle of what we call the atrium. Uh, and you can go there and ask questions. And the other place that you can go and ask questions, um, 
and I'm not I'm not dissing them when I'm saying this. Sometimes they know the answers, and sometimes they don't. But um, uh, it's a it's a safe bet to ask uh, at, at at the police desk and security. And both those places are very near the Learning Commons where I work and hang out a lot. In fact, I'm talking to you from the Learning Commons right now. I'm all by myself, but I'm talking to you from here anyway. Uh, okay, so Timor, thank you for that, and uh, Tony. Uh, and Tony, I saw you going on and off. Are you having technical difficulties or are you doing okay? Uh, I think I'm doing better now. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you very well. It is a, it is a good connection that we have. And, um, I, and, and things are fragile. I, I really don't like Blackboard Ultra very much, but you know, we have to use something. So that's what we're, uh, that's what we're using. You have any questions, Tony, about, uh, of me about the class or anything? Oh, no, I, I think I'm fine for now, honestly. Okay, excellent. That's all good. Uh, if uh, Tony or anybody else has questions, you should ask them. Awesome. Okay, now I'm going to go back then, and I'm going to share my application screen, and we're going to talk about other things. And let's see, I'm going to go to the PowerPoint slides. It's here. All right, so we did the po polling, and I guess we're several limits to evaluate. Okay, so here are a handful of limits. I don't know how many of these we will do, but I think we'll do some of them. And one of the things that happens in textbooks is often, this is actually jerked out of another textbook, but every textbook is kind of the same about this. What they will do is they will ask questions that are very like each other. It's like, for example, when I glance at this page of things that I kind of tore out of a book, uh, question 57 and question question 57 and uh, 58 are very similar. The only difference between them is, well, it's really um, the 3 and 57 is replaced with the 4. So we really don't need to do uh, all of those. But I think there's a benefit in, in doing all of these. And I got to tell you what I would do if we were in class. Uh, if we were in class, I would throw up a problem and say, okay, everybody uh, give this a go. And in fact, if we weren't in a COVID crisis, I would actually have you guys working together in groups and, you know, you'd, you'd work on a problem and, and if you solved it, great. If you didn't solve it, we'd go through it and you'd learn something and so on and so forth. So that's kind of, um, that's kind of okay. Uh, so what I'm going to do uh, is uh, I'm going to start with, and boy, this looks awfully familiar. So I'm thinking that I probably did uh, 56 uh, before. D does that look uh, familiar to anybody? Yes. Does it look familiar or not? It looks familiar because you need to multiply by the... Uh, okay, good. So I'm not going to do 56. That just happens to be here. Now, it, it turns out, though, that uh, 57 is a little bit different. And so I'm going to work um, 57 and uh, do this. And basically, 57 requires you to do some algebra. Okay, so I'm writing down what 57 is about, and then we're going to uh, we're going to do it. Okay, so let's see. This is okay. So I'm going to go to. Um, so I'm stopping sharing here. I'm going to go back to this, and I'm going to share a blank whiteboard with you. Okay, so we're going to work this, uh, this problem. Okay, so what this problem says is the limit as x tends to 0 Of and uh, I am writing it differently, but this is what it means. It's the same thing. Three plus x. Minus one over three. And then this is all over x. Now, one of the things I encourage you to remember 
is that you think about if only for a nanosecond can I just plug X in. If I plug X into the numerator, I get a third minus a third, which uh, X equals zero. I get a third minus a third, which is zero. And if I put zero in the denominator, I get zero. And so zero over zero is an indeterminate form. And so, oh, that didn't work. And what you're going to find is that really doesn't work very often at all. Uh, but um, what's going to happen is we're now going to do algebra on this expression. So I'm going to say that this is equal to, and now what I'm going to do, uh, my students, is I'm getting a common denominator up here. And the common denominator is going to be 3 times a whole of 3 plus x. So that's what I'm going to get here. Okay, so this is going to be, here I have to multiply top and bottom by 3. And then minus, and here I have to multiply top and bottom by 3 plus x. Now you might notice that I'm multiplying top and bottom by the whole of 3 plus x. So that's what I have is there. And then I have this is 3 times 3 plus x. And so now what I've done is I have um, subtracted that numerator and that's what I got. But then I have a big old line here and this is x. And I really uh, want to teach you good form. So you see, I haven't really done a limit yet. And so this is, um, I still need to have the limit here. Okay, very good. And there's an equal sign here. So this thing is equal to that. Okay, so now I am going to simplify the numerator in the numerator. So I have 3 minus 3 minus x. So you see this is going to be equal to the limit as x goes to 0. Of, uh, let's see. The limit as x goes to 0 of, this is minus x, all over 3 times 3 plus x. And this is all over, a big old line, all over x. Now, uh, what really happens is, so I got the numerator divided by the denominator, and it helps some students to think about that as being x over 1. I don't know if that matters to you at or not. But what really happens is if you do the algebra here, this x will cancel with this x. And so what I have is that this is equal to the limit as x tends to 0. Uh, and now I simplify, so I've canceled those things out. So this is minus 1 over 3 times 3 plus x. And I think I call this canceling the common factor, but the common factor wasn't um, oh, obvious until you did the, um, did the algebra. So we did some algebra there. And uh, again, now we've done work because we've canceled out a common factor. And so we can again say, can we just plug in x equals 0? And of course, you can. And so the answer to this problem is minus 1 over 9. OK, so I'm going to pause for a count of 10 Mississippi in case um, anybody wants to, I don't know, ask some questions about what we did. Okay, so no one asked any questions. That's uh, that's fine. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this out. And a lot of times I'm not going to remember to do this, but this time I am. So when I go back to the PowerPoint show, I can. I'm adding a. Uh, I'm I'm doing things that you can't see. That's okay. But I'm adding a, oh, a solution there to that. And so that's, uh, that's what we have. 
Okay, and I think now I am going to go back and uh, let's see. All right, so I'm going to share again. I'm sharing my applications screen with you. And go, oops, somebody had a comment. I'll go back and look at the applic. Uh, look what at whatever they they said. Uh, now, and I think it's Jeffrey. Jeffrey, can you see a PowerPoint slide now? Yes. All right, excellent. And this is a PowerPoint slide where I just pasted the stuff that I did on the on the thing. And I'm going to go now. I have to stop sharing for a moment to go back there because someone had a comment. And a comment might just be they didn't see what I was showing. Uh, maybe there wasn't a comment. Wow, I thought there was. Let me check in case there's another comment. Huh, there, I guess there was no comment. I thought I saw a comment, but maybe the comment got withdrawn. I don't, I don't know. Okay, so we will go back to sharing screens again. And we'll look at another problem to do. Okay, so I will share that and then we'll look at my thing. That's good. Now I'm going to go back to this next one. Okay, that was problem 57 and 58 is the same kind of thing. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to leap to problem 62. And the reason that I'm leaping to 62 is 62 is a different kind of problem. Now, we're going to be doing problem 62 or problems like problem 62 very frequently uh, in this class because when we start using the limit definition of the derivative, this is actually um, uh, a derivative. Now, I think this particular book that I jerked this out of uh, uses delta x as what goes to zero, and I think your textbook probably lets x uh, let's let's uh, let's uh, h go to uh, zero, uh, but anyway, this 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 is a good example. Now, here the important thing for you to understand as 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 we go to work this though is delta x is a is a thing. It could have been a z or something like that, uh, but it's standing for the change in x. And in fact, even in our book when we're talking about H, they really will be saying, oh, but H is really delta X. So anyway, we're going to do this. And, and maybe in fact, when I write this, I'll change this to the limit as H goes to zero. But this is a calculation that you will be doing when we're doing derivatives. Okay, so this is 62, and I think I know what that is. So I'm going to stop sharing. I am so looking forward to being back in class when we don't have to do all this uh, gymnastics here. Ah, and I'm sharing a blank whiteboard, and that's not blank, so I will make it blank. I'm erasing it. And now I'm going to write the problem at hand, which is more or less problem 62. So this is the limit as, and I am going to call this h goes to zero, but it could have been delta x goes to zero. In fact, that's what it was. And then the function is x plus h whole cubed. Minus x cubed. And it's all over h. Now, so this is a limit for you to evaluate. Now, one of the things that I, um, you know, uh, encourage you to do is to uh, always think about, if only for a nanosecond, oh, just plug it in as a strategy. So let's just, just see what happens. And if you try to just plug it in, and we've already invested more than a nanosecond on this, but you'll get zero over zero. And, and in fact, most of the time you'll get zero over zero. Now, just to help encourage you to do that, every so often I will do something where you can just plug it in. And, and so, you know, I, I want to keep you honest on that. But off, more often than not, you will get zero over zero. And so that means we have to do something. Now, again, this is going to be uh, common to a thing we talked about earlier. Um, and, uh, and that is the, um, 
the, um, let's see, how did I want to say that? Um, we're going to do algebra, okay? So I'm going to just do algebra on the function. So this is still the limit. As h goes to zero. So now I'm doing algebra. Now, this x plus h whole cubed is x cubed. Well, I'm just going to write what it is. I'm going to have to start writing tiny because I didn't, uh, in fact, you know what? I'm not trusting myself to write legibly that tiny. So I'm going to do write this a little bit different. But I'm going to expand that. Now, maybe you have to expand that by taking x plus h times x plus h times x plus h. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Or maybe you remember the binomial theorem that you studied. And that's how I'm going to do it. So what I'm doing is I'm doing this calculation. So I'm taking x plus h times x plus h times x plus h. Now, here's what you get when you do that. So we have x cubed plus, and, and this is going to be 3, and then this is x squared times h. And then this is going to be plus, and this is going to be 3. And now this is x, and now this is times h squared. Then this is going to be plus h cubed. So what I did so far is I really just took h plus uh, h times x plus h times x plus h, multiplied it all together, and I get this. And I know a theorem that allows me to do this, and maybe you all know the theorem too. Don't know. And then I'm subtracting off x cubed. You can say, oh, that first term is going to cancel with this one, and that's a good observation. But that's oh a first step that you would get. OK, now what I am going to do in this next step is I'm going to cancel this guy with this guy. And, I'm, and since I don't have a whole lot of space here, I'm also going to factor out an h. Because you see, after I cancel this guy with this guy, they're not there anymore. And each of these three terms has a factor of h in it. So I'm doing that just because I don't have a lot of space here. So this is a limit. Still, notice that I don't erase the limit until I take the limit, and I'm factoring the h out. And so what I have left is 3x squared plus, and this is going to be 3x, and there's only h to the first power left plus, and then I have h squared there so far. But then I have the h down here. Now you might say, well, I canceled out the x cubed, so can I plug h uh, equal to 0 again? And you'll say, nope, that's not going to work because I will get 0 over 0. But now I observe, and this is one of the techniques that we studied, I can cancel out the common factor. So I'm going to whack that h with that h. Okay, so then what I have is the limit as h goes to 0 of 3x squared plus 3xh plus h squared. Now, I always ask myself as I go along, uh, can I plug h to be equal to 0? And here, I can eff effectively plug h to be 0. So let's talk about what, uh, what will happen here. So the limit as h goes to 0 of 3x squared, well, x is really a constant depending on, 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 on what h is. And so it doesn't depend on h. So that's really just a constant. So the limit as h goes to 0 of? 5 is just 5, and so the limit of 3x squared as h goes to 0 is just 3x squared. Now here, again, the x is a constant, so this is just, I just plug it in, and I get this is 0. And here I could put h to be 0, and I get 0. Now this is uh, a case where we don't get a number, we get a function. But this limit that we just did is 3 x squared. 
And later on, we're going to uh, talk about um, oh, a derivative. And in fact, we'll find that this, in fact, is the derivative of x cubed. I did have a student one time who said, well, yeah, but in high school, um, you know, I was in a, an advanced class, and uh, we didn't have to do these limits. In this class, you do have to do the limits because I will ask you to do the limits. And so, uh, uh, anyway, uh, so uh, and and then sh and the student further said, "Oh yes, but we had uh, you know, our teacher was really good, and and he knew a lot more than you did." Well, that may be. I, I didn't know their teacher, but uh, I know plenty of math to teach this course to you. And so we will get to those fancy theorems very soon, but we're not there yet. We're just taking limits. So anyway, this is three uh, X squared. Okay, so I'm pausing for a count of 10 Mississippi just because this is important stuff that we're covering. And the reason I'm pausing is so you can ask questions if you want. Okay, I got to 10, so I'm going to erase this. Actually, you know what I think I'm going to do is I think I'm going to, um, you don't have to be able to see what I'm doing. I don't know if you can. It's okay if you can, and if you can't, that's all right, too. I'm just taking a picture of this, and I'm going to go paste it into the PowerPoint slides. So I'm going over there, and I will make a new slide. and pasting it into the PowerPoint slides. So, all right, and so that's um, that's good. And now I think I need to go back and figure out where I am. Okay, so now I've pasted that. So can I can erase this? And I'm going to share with you my application screen in a moment. I'm going back to the thing and. Uh, I think it's Jeffrey who's working with it. Jeffrey, you can see a PowerPoint slide now? I do see a PowerPoint slide. Excellent. Now, I actually, I, I'm, I've got to be careful because some of this I did in the, um, some of this I did in the, um, in the video, and I don't want to re be repeating myself, but um, uh, that's okay. Um, I don't know that I did number 63, so I'm going to do uh, number 63. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing. I will go and share a blank whiteboard. It should be blank now. It is. Okay, so this was the limit. And by the way, uh, do watch those videos, and if you're not current on watching the videos, it's okay, uh, but um, I think they're useful. I actually do a nice geometrical proof of this uh, thing, and it is something you want to remember. So this is a limit as x goes to zero, and it is a sine the trig function of x over 5x. Now I'm going to do this, I think, uh, I guess I really have to do it just one way. Okay. Now one of the things that we learned was if you have the limit of a constant times a function, you can pull the constant through the um, limit sign. And so you see, I got a 1 over 5 here. I'm wiggling my cursor. I think you can see that. So this is the same thing at, using my properties of limits as this is 1 over 5. Uh, and then this is going to be um, 1 over 5. And uh, then it's the limit. as x goes to 0. And now this is sine x over x. 
Now, in the video, I proved to you what this limit was, and it's something you want to oh, commit to memory. So I have 1 over 5. And in the video, we learned that the limit as x goes to 0 of sine x over x is equal to 1. Now, um, we did not get that just by plugging it in, because if we plug in 0, we get 0 over 0. And there's not fancy algebra that we can do here. And that's why the video that I did, um, where I showed you geometrically uh, why this has to be uh, 1, is an uh, important um, viewing. But we know that limit is 1. And again, you see, you don't care what happens to 0 because this is just a limit. Now, we're going to change that concept in just a bit because we're going to say, hey, we're going to start caring about what happens at 0 when we're talking about continuous functions. But that's not just raw limits. That's con continuity, an additional concept. So this is 1 fifth times 1. So the answer to this is uh, 1 over 5. I think the one that I did in the video was sine 5x over x. And um, so that maybe was a better, uh, I, not a better example, but a different example. So I'm going to pause for a count of, I don't know, uh, 10 Mississippi to see if anybody's got questions or comments on this one. Okay, nobody had comments, so I'm going to erase this. Uh, I should have pasted that, damn it. I'm not going to go back and fix that. Um, okay, I was trying to take pictures of those, but that's okay. Uh, I'm trying to think of which other one I want to do. Uh, okay, I'm going to do 60. Uh, let's see. Hmm. I'm going to do 67. Okay. Uh, so let's see. I'm going to then share. Maybe I'm still at the whiteboard. Jeffrey, are you still seeing a whiteboard? I am. Good, excellent. Okay, I see. I mean, you're you're actually adding value here, Jeffrey. I know it seems really lame, but um, I know what I'm looking at, but I don't know what the students are seeing all the time. Okay, so this problem that I um, suggested that I was going to do with you is this one. It was the limit as uh, x goes to 0, and this was going to be sine squared x over x. Uh, let's see. OK, so that's what I've got. And so now I'm going to use properties of limits. And so this is the same thing as the limit as x goes to 0. And this is, now I'm choosing to write this as sine of x over x times the sine of x. Now, certainly that's algebraically true. And then I know that the limit of the product is the product of the limits.
But we know, because of the theorem and the geometry proof that I did, that this one is 1. And here, in the rare instance, because we, this doesn't happen very often, well, we can just plug it in. And the limit as x goes to 0 of sine x is 0. So the answer to this problem is 0. I think, given the nature of this problem, I'm only going to count to 5, uh, pausing for questions. OK, and I know I screwed that up once, but I'm going to try to uh, cut this again. It's, it's not. These aren't perfect lectures. Nothing's perfect. And that's OK. So I am copying this. I'm going back to the PowerPoint slides. And I'm going to paste that in somewhere here. New slide, and I will paste it. Then I will come back and I will erase it. Okay, and I'll save that just in case I want to look at it. And so now I will go back to you here. I will erase it here. And I will share my application screen with you yet again and show you the PowerPoint slides that I made preparing for this class. And we'll pick out another uh, problem for us to do. And we're going to do 66. OK, so 66 is the uh, limit as theta goes to 0. This is the last one we're going to do of this batch. Uh, this is cosine of theta, tan theta, all over theta. OK, uh, actually, sorry about that. I am I'm lying. We're going to do one more after this. Uh, and maybe I should have done the other one first. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to, I'm changing my mind. I'm doing 65, which is sine uh, x, 1 minus cosine x, or x squared. And and th this may be one that I did during the, uh, during the video. I'm not sure. But if it is, we'll just do it again. OK. And again, Jeffrey, you're looking at a whiteboard, yes? Tell you what, Jeffrey, just to make it easier on you, if you're not seeing what I say, you don't have to always say, and I mean, you're doing a great job, so I'm not being critical, but I'm trying to make it easier on you. Uh, if you're seeing what I'm talking about, let me know. If not, I'm going to ask you to say, hey, Jim, you're, you're, you're lost in space somewhere, OK? All right, so this is the okay. limit as uh, I think we were saying theta. Now, that's a dummy variable. Uh, so I'm getting my eraser because I'm going to make that into a theta this time. So this is the limit as theta goes to 0. And this was sine x. times 1 minus cosine theta. I got to change that x to theta. I wasn't paying attention. OK, so I'll find my eraser. I'll make that into a theta. And this was over theta squared. OK, so uh, what's going to happen is I'm going to do two steps at once, really. Uh, I'm going to do some algebra, and I'm going to use a different property of limits. So this is the same thing as the limit as theta goes to 0 of sine theta over theta. 
Okay, and then this is the limit as, uh, I'm doing two steps at once here. Limit as theta goes to zero of one minus cosine theta. all over uh, theta uh, yet again. Okay, so uh, what's happening here then is uh, this one is one. And what I did here is I, I did algebra, so I divided the theta into the sine theta, and I also divided the theta into this other factor, which I certainly can do. And then I said the limit of the product is the product of the limits, assuming that everything still exists. And it does, and so this one is one. And this one, and the reason I picked this one to do is this is one that I have not talked about uh, in class yet, but I talked about it at great length on the video. And I proved this. I did an algebraic proof of this one using a trig identity. Uh, but uh, it turns out you can't just plug zero in, because if you plug in zero, you get zero over zero again. But I did a geometric algebra proof uh, for you of this. And this uh, ends up being zero. So the answer to this problem here is uh, that this limit is zero. I'm going to pause for a count of 10 Mississippi, because this has a little bit of a new concept being talked about. I'm talking about this concept right here. So now I'm counting. You, you, you all should ask questions if you got them. Okay, so let's see. I, I was trying to uh, cut pictures of this. So let's see if I can do that again. So don't worry about what I'm doing. I'm just trying to make my PowerPoint a little bit more complete. OK, so I'm pasting this in. And there was one of those that I didn't include, but that's, that's OK because I think we're doing enough examples now. OK, and so I've got that. I will save it. And now I'm going to go to uh, So I'm erasing this. And I'm going to go back, share my application screen. And uh, you are now, and you probably can't tell the difference between this and the screen that I had, but now I, I change it, and uh, this is a uh, this is a now a um, is a uh, PowerPoint slide, uh, Jeffrey. And again, if I don't hear from you, then it just means yes, Jim, I see a PowerPoint slide. Okay, so uh, now we're going to start talking about a different concept for the balance of the period. It's a brand new concept. I haven't talked about it with you guys in a video uh, before, but it is a very important uh, concept. So, and I know I'm reading to you, but that's fine. Uh, in mathematics, the term continuous has much the same meaning it has in everyday usage. Informally, we say that a function f is continuous at x equal to c means that there is no interruption in the graph of uh, f at c. That is, its graph is unbroken at c. Uh, and there are no holes, jumps, or gaps. Uh, and this picture identifies uh, three values of x at which the graph is not continuous. At all other points in the interval a, b, the graph is um, uh, uninterrupted and, uh, and and the function is continuous. So okay, so here in this one, and I, I, you guys, I think have told me you can see me wiggling my cursor. So I'm wiggling my cursor under this one. There's a hole there. So you see, f is not defined at c. You might say, well, that's a small hole. I can just jump over it. Well, you do that at your peril because that means f of x is not defined at that point 
at all. So you gotta be a little careful. Now, if you're just talking about the limit, you don't care. If you're talking about continuity, perhaps you do, because this function is discontinuous at C. You might think, well, I can, another informal way that people say is, oh, I can trace it without lifting my, um, my pencil. And you might say, well, yeah, but I can just jump over that little hole. No, you can't. You would fall through that hole. And uh, this is a local phenomenon, and um, there you go. So this is a case where f of c is not defined, and the graph is not continuous. It is interrupted. Now, similar to that, but not exactly, there's a different function that's shown over here on the far right. And here we do have a hole in the function. But then with a little dot down here. Now this function is defined. You're going along here and then it goes down. You dot it here and then you go back up and you follow along. Now this one is different than the first example because the first example was not defined at C and this is defined at C. But neither one of them is continuous because you have a hole here. Now both of these, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but both of these for certain applications are called, actually not just for certain applications, both of these are called removable discontinuities. Here you could say, oh, for certain kind of problems, that is if you were finding the area, the area under point is going to be zero, so you could just color it in. Or here you could say, oh, I'll just redefine the point to, to be up here. So these are called removable discontinuities. I probably will talk about uh, removable discontinuities in, in, in a bit. That's some vocabulary. But this one is totally different because this one, you're going along here, and the limit from the left is whatever this value is. The limit from the right is whatever this value is, but they're not the same. And I would refer to this as a jump discontinuity uh, because, and there's no way for you to redefine the function at one point. So this is an, not a removable discontinuity. Okay, so these are three uh, kind of fundamental examples of things that can happen uh, in terms of um, uh, discontinuity. So it appears that uh, continuity at x equals c can be destroyed uh, by any of three conditions, and we'll talk about what those is. But I'm going to pause for a count of five Mississippi in case anybody wants to uh, discuss anything that I said or um, did here. Uh, I heard a little noise, so let's go see if somebody had a comment. Uh, so I'm... Stopping share it. Yes, Herr Patel has her hand up. That is good. Uh, and let me think, think about this. Uh, her hand is up, so I'm calling on you. Yes, uh, what, is your, uh, what is your comment? Uh, yeah, so for the last graph you had, you said uh, it was removable, right? Um, first of all, I need to go back to that picture, so... Uh, and I do understand your question. So we're going back to there. And so often, and, and that's, that's why it's really good being face to face. Uh, I'm gonna repeat what I, what I uh, should have said, what I think I did say. Um, this leftmost picture at x equals c, it is a discontinuity, but that is a removal discontinuity because I can get rid of the discontinuity by coloring in, by redef redefining the function at that point. And I could just color it in. And if I colored that in, then I'd say, oh yeah, it's a, it's a continuous function. So that is an example of a removable discontinuity. Now the far right example also, is a removable discontinuity. Now this one is different because you're going through and then you gotta drop down, get this point and then come back. So again, this function also is discontinuous at C. But again, this is a removable discontinuity because I could say, well, I'm just going to redefine the function at that point and I'm gonna color it in up here uh, so that you know, I could turn it into a continuous function. And the reason that we, we define that is not just to be defining it, but it turns out there are applications that we'll have, like later in the course, 
where we're finding the area under curves and the area under a point is of no consequence. The area under a point is zero. And we'll talk about why that is true later. But so the first example on the far left and the one on the far right are both removable discontinuities. Now this thing in the middle is not a removable discontinuity. It is called, well, you could call it an irremovable discontinuity, or you could call it a jump discontinuity, uh, because there is no way that you can redefine the function at C so that this function is continuous, whereas on the first and the last one, you could. So if you went up to, and you might say, oh, no, I think I can. Well, if you color in the bottom dot, that didn't do it. If you uh, color in anywhere in between, that didn't do it either. So you see in the first and third, uh, you can uh, redefine things. And, and, and if you redefine things at a single point, that's called removal discontinuity. And I probably shouldn't have almost talked about that because I will talk about that later. But that's, uh, that's my answer to your question. And while I might not have even been sharing that to you, damn it. I probably wasn't sharing that. I, I don't know. That's I apologize okay. for that. I understand. Uh, did, did, did it make, yeah. And Jeffrey, thank you for weighing in. Jeffrey did what he's, what he's supposed to. Yeah, I am. Um, yeah. I okay. Think. Okay. But, but you're good right now. You think, yes. Oh yeah, I was, I, I did. Great. Okay. It. Okay. Excellent. I was actually pointing to the slide, but no one could see it. Okay, so now what we want to do is go back to the story about continuity again. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'll just share again. That way I know what I'm doing. So I now am sharing my application screen. I'm going back to, and so uh, Jeffrey, we're looking at PowerPoint slides. Again, yeah, and that, that's, that was the one I was trying to talk about. Okay, um, so, so I, I'm just reading to you again, but continuity at x equals c can be destroyed by any one of three conditions. If the function is not defined yeah. at x equals c, it can't be continuous. Um, the limit of f of x does not exist at x equal c, and that's the case of the jump discontinuity, actually. And the limit exists at x equal c, but is not equal to f of c. And that was the one that was, uh, hmm, I think that was the far right example. Okay, now let's suppose you don't have any of those, and this is a whole bunch of double negatives, but uh, I think if you think about this enough, you'll, um, you'll um, feel comfortable with this. Okay, so if none of these three conditions is true, then the function f is called continuous at c. And this is the definition below. Now, what happens is that this definition, and I don't know if I like, well, this definition is okay, but there also is an epsilon delta definition, which I am not going to share with you today, but I'll share with you either on a video or I might share it you know, next time we meet or something like that. You can actually define continuity using epsilons and deltas too. And I think that's worth discussing, except I'm not gonna discuss it now. Uh, so uh, you could take this as being the definition of continuous. And that means, well, and I'm just reading to you again, but a function is continuous at C when all three of these conditions are met. You have to have all three or you don't have continuity. And it's really dealing with those examples that we talked about before. So a function is continuous at C. First, you have to have f of C must be defined. If f of C isn't defined, it's not continuous. Now, realize that this is a huge difference between limits. A limit doesn't care what happens at C. For a function to be continuous, you have to have f of C defined. Whoa, big difference right there. The other thing that you uh, have to have, or there's two other things, but the next thing that you have to have is the limit as x tends to C of f of x exists. Now means the limit from the right and the limit from the left both exist and are equal to the same thing.
And then number three, it says the limit as x tends to c of f of x has to be equal to f of c. And I have a daughter, Beth, and I love my daughter, Beth. Um, and uh, I have I, never taught Beth math. Uh, Beth always was pretty good at math, and she didn't need any of my help. Uh, but uh, uh, I do know what Beth would say about this. Yeah, if a function is continuous, if it does what it's supposed to do. Well, a function can do anything at once, and, and there isn't a supposed to. But you see, continuity is a nice thing. And in my daughter's Beth language, this would be, oh, yeah, the function does what it ought to do. Okay, so anyway, this is the definition of continuity. Uh, there will be another definition of uh, continuity later, and maybe what I'll do is write that here as a text thing. Um, uh, later, and again, you can't see what I'm writing until I'm finished writing it, because that's the way Blackboard Ultra works. Later, um, we will see an epsilon. Delta, ah, I misspelled epsilon, damn it. Epsilon delta definition for continuity. That is something to look forward to. Okay. All right, so we have that, and I think we're finished with this slide. So we have a brand new concept of continuity. Okay. I'm going to the next slide then, and it, now that was continuity at a point. So that's saying at a point C, there are three conditions that have to be met. And again, I'm not going to go back to that slide, but f of C must be defined. The limit as x tends to C of f of x must exist, and the limit as x tends to C of f of x equal um, equal uh, f of C. Okay, but so that's at a point C. But we can define continuity on an open interval, and we say a function is continuous on an open interval, and here we're talking about the open interval being A to B, when the function is continuous at each point in the interval. A function that is continuous on the entire real number line, you say minus infinity, to infinity is continuous everywhere. Okay, some more words. So consider an open interval i that contains a real number c. If a function defined on i, except possibly at c, and f is not continuous, then we can say that f uh, is, has a discontinuity at c. Now discontinuities fall into two categories. Here's the words I was talking about, removable and non-removable. A discontinuity at c is called removable when f can be made continuous by appropriately defining or redefining f of c. Um, and uh, this talks about a and c being removable discontinuities, and that uh, the one in the middle has a non-removable discontinuity. And I think I actually said all of that already. Yeah, and, the, and I said all this already. Removable discontinuity. Removable discontinuity, non-removable discontinuity. Okay, so we can look at pictures, certainly, but we can also look at functions. And a lot of times it makes sense for you to graph these things in order to, uh, in order to talk about them. Uh, so let's discuss the continuity of each of these uh, functions. So you have y equals f of x equal 1 over x. Now I'm just going to jump ahead and look at what the graph of this looks like. And here's what the graph of y equals f of x equals 1 over x. It looks like this. And this is a vertical asymptote at x equal to 0. Okay. Well, you see, and, and this is what I often tell my students is, informally, if you, can, if you can trace the curve and never have to lift your chalk, it's continuous. So I'm tracing this curve. This is my, you're, you're supposed to be able to see my cursor over here. So I can trace it, and I can even go down to minus infinity uh, because, uh, you know, that is one of my superpowers. But I can go down to minus 1 infinity, but I never had to lift my chalk whenever x was less than 0. So this is continuous for x less than 0. And also for x greater than 0, 
I can be tracing this thing with never lifting my chalk and I can go all the way to infinity because that's one of my superpowers. But where is this function continuous? Well, it's continuous everywhere except at x equals zero. But you see, even though I have superpowers, I cannot jump from minus infinity to plus infinity without lifting my chalk. So this has a non-removable discontinuity at x equals zero. And the reason it's non-removable is there's no way that I could redefine this function at x equals zero such that it would be continuous because there's no good way to get from minus infinity to infinity. It just can't be done. Okay, let's look at another example. I'm going back to the you know list of things. I said I was gonna do chalk talks. I'm not doing that. I'm just going to the pictures, but anyway. Uh, okay, so this is uh, y equals g of x equal. The numerator is x squared minus one. Uh, the denominator is x minus one. And we're to discuss the continuity uh, of this. Now, you've done enough thinking about limits and things like that, that I hope right away you say, oh yeah, but if I were talking about limits, I could factor that top into uh, x plus one times x minus one. And I could cancel the x minus one with the x minus one, except when x is equal to one. And so this uh, g of x would be equal to x plus one, except when we're at minus one. And there is no way I can, uh, well, I, I'm not gonna say that the function itself, this x squared minus one over x minus one, that's zero over zero, that's not defined. At, at one. Uh, so you see this cannot be continuous at x equal to one because it's not defined there. But this is a removable discontinuity because if I were to redefine it at x equal one and just color in that dot, then I can say, oh, it's really just this line, which is y equal in this case x plus one. Okay, let's go back. I know what time it is. Don't worry about that. Okay, so I went to the, uh, this new one. Now, this is a piecewise uh, defined function. This is y is equal to h of x. And if x is less than or equal to, and you see it matters where it's one equal to, but I get, uh, when x is less than or equal to, I get x plus one. That is a line. If x is strictly bigger than one, I get the parabola x squared plus one. Let's look at the graph of this. Someone maybe has a question, so I will pause and see what that is. Hold on. Uh, it's me, Professor. Uh, okay. Yeah. I just wanted to let you know that What's up? Uh, your microphone is kind of cutting out a little bit. It might just be me. I don't know if anybody else is having that problem, but um, just as of the last slide, your mic is No, there. it's happening. Okay. Okay, well, you know, uh, Blackboard Ultra is kind of um, not not great. So, and I don't really know. Uh, it could actually be an internet. Can you hear me now, well, Jeffrey? It's uh, it's doing a little better. Also, this is Alex, but close enough. Oh, okay, and maybe I just need to use my teacher's voice. Uh, anyway, this piecewise defined, and, and thank you for letting me know. That's what you yeah, should do. Good. This piecewise defined function. This piecewise defined function, I can uh, graph this with never lifting my piece of chalk. Now it turns out that's because the limit from this side is one, it's from this side is one, and at uh, zero, it is equal to one. And the sign is equal to, um, is, is continuous everywhere. And so I guess this is maybe a good place to stop. I am gonna go back and, and maybe people were just leaving, but maybe, there were comments. Ah, oh, Herr Patel has a question. Please let's respect the, the question. And so uh, I am. I lowered your hand, but I'm calling on you. What is your question, please? Oh, I was just saying, like, at the end you were talking, but you weren't sharing, so I was just saying that. Oh, okay. Um, that kind of is what it is. Okay. Um, we're 85 minutes in and you're supposed to get 83 minutes and change. And so this is a good place for us to uh, stop. I will stop recording this thing and someday I will 